Good evening and welcome to another presentation from the Agency for Public Information. I am Shana Daniel. The API is your official source for up-to-date information on the plans, programs and policies of the Government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Just ahead on this evening's program, Prime Minister the Honorable Dr. Ralph Gonzalez said that derogatory comments allegedly made by U.S. President Donald Trump should be used as a teaching moment. Minister of National Mobilization the Honorable Frederick Stevenson updates us on his ministry's performance in the second part of an interview. And we take in some of the Ministry of Education's annual Thanksgiving church service. The details to those stories will follow Newswatch with Nellie Skupid. Good evening, this is Newswatch for Tuesday, January 16, 2018. I'm Nelly Skipper. thanks for joining us. The Honorable Sir Louis Straker, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Commerce, is currently the victim of fraudulent social media accounts. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Commerce, in a press release, said that fraudulent accounts were created on social media platforms, that is, Instagram, Gmail, and WhatsApp, using Minister Straker's name. The social media handle or name used on the accounts is hon.sirlewistraker1647, and this is being used across social media platforms to solicit money and financial information from unsuspecting individuals. According to the release, the creation of the accounts appear to be acts of malice and are in no way sanctioned by the Honorable Sir Louis. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Commerce is therefore cautioning the public to be aware of interactions on these platforms by anyone claiming to represent the Honorable Sir Louis Straker. The individual or individuals engaging in these unlawful actions are urged to stop. Anyone with information regarding this matter is asked to contact the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Commerce at 4562060 or the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force at 4571211. The Executive Board of the World Pediatric Project is currently visiting St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The board, along with the team, arrived in St. Vincent and the Grenadines on Sunday, January 14th. Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Honorable Dr. Ralph Gonzalez and Mrs. Eloise Gonzalez, welcomed the board with a dinner held at the Prime Minister's residence. The team will visit with beneficiaries of the project and with other stakeholders. They have since visited the pediatric ward of the Milton Cater Memorial Hospital. Colin O'Brien John and Frankie Joseph are the new Acting Commissioner of Police and Acting Deputy Commissioner of Police respectively in St. Vincent and the Grenadines as of January 2, 2018. Acting Commissioner John succeeds former Acting Commissioner Reynold Hadaway who proceeded on pre-retirement leave on January 1, 2018. Acting Commissioner John brings tremendous experience and knowledge to the organization which he now leads. He was enlisted in the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force in 1988. Upon gaining his law degree, he was transferred to the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions in 2011, where he served as Assistant Director of Public Prosecution until 2016. John then rejoined the police force at the rank of Deputy Commissioner of Police Acting. Meanwhile, Deputy Commissioner of Police Acting Frankie Joseph, a veteran police officer, was enlisted in the police force on July 10, 1987. His previous postings included the Immigration Department and the Police Training School. Deputy Commissioner Acting Frankie Joseph holds a degree in Criminal Psychology. And finally on Newswatcher this evening, Prime Minister the Honorable Dr. Ralph Gonzalez and Mrs. Eloise Gonzalez hosted a reception for the Clergy Association of Castries of the Roman Catholic Church last evening. The clergy is in St. Vincent and the Grenadines for the 34th Conference of the Provincial Clergy of the Parish of Castries. 
The Catholic Diocese of St. Vincent and the Grenadines will rejoin the Castries Parish this year. This is where we end News Watch for this evening. I'm Nelly Skipid. The API presentation continues. Have a good evening. Did you know that the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines implemented a ban on the importation of styrofoam products as of May 1, 2017? A message brought to you by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Commerce. Thank you for staying with us and if you're just joining us, then welcome. This is the presentation from the API. At a press conference held yesterday, January 15th, Prime Minister the Honorable Dr. Ralph Gonzalez said that the comments allegedly made by U.S. President Donald Trump, in which he referred to African and Latin American countries by a derogatory name, should be used as a teaching moment. Prime Minister Gonzalez said that while the alleged comments should be denounced, as has been done by CARICOM, more importantly, it should be a teaching moment to educate our people so that they can advance and lift themselves. The first hemispheric regional international issue I want to touch on concerns the remarks of His Excellency Donald J. Trump, President of the United States of America where on Thursday at a meeting on immigration at the White House of representatives and senators of the United States Congress it was reported that he made certain remarks about certain countries which he described as S dot 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 whole countries H O L E. I'm not yet sure whether I should repeat the word itself. I hear it on CNN, I hear it everywhere, but I think at least for the time being, un unless you advise otherwise, I would say S dot 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 whole countries. On Friday morning, very early, I had a statement drafted. The foreign minister came to see me and of course made a request for a statement that we issue a statement. So I had a statement drafted. I told him that what I'd like to do first is to send it to CARICOM as a draft so that CARICOM could look at it and presumably other countries will send out a draft to CARICOM so that CARICOM, the CARICOM Secretariat can do a, a statement which CARICOM did issued over the weekend which I would read. You can find it on their website on other websites too. It says the Caribbean community CARICOM is deeply disturbed by reports about the use of derogatory and repulsive language by the President of the United States in respect of our member state Haiti and other developing countries. CARICOM condemns in the strongest terms the unenlightened views reportedly expressed. Of additional concern is this pattern of denigrating Haiti and its citizens and what seems to be a concerted attempt to perpetuate a negative narrative of the country. We are especially saddened that such narrative emerged around the time of the anniversary of the devastating 2010 earthquake which took so many lives of citizens in that country. The Caribbean community expresses its full support for the dignified statement of the government of the Republic of Haiti in reaction to this highly offensive reference. 
It should be recalled that Haiti is the second democracy in the Western Hemisphere after the United States, and that Haitians continue to contribute significantly in many respects to the global community and particularly to the United States of America. CARICOM therefore views this insult to the character of the countries named and their citizens as totally unacceptable. And of course, our government endorses the statement, except to say that I will take issue with that Haiti is the second oldest democracy in the hemisphere. I would say it's the oldest, because in 1776, when the United States was established, it was established with slavery in operation. It wasn't until the 1860s that slavery was abolished in the United States, and sometime after that black people had the right to vote in the United States. Um, whereas from the beginning, it's the Haitian slaves under Toussaint Louverture would overthrew the slave regime and overthrew the colonial regime in Haiti, the French colonial regime. In fact, the, the black Jacobins, as they are called by CLR James, was written a book by that title, C.L.R. James being a very important 20th century Caribbean intellectual out of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, that the black Jacobins not only defeated the French, but they also had defeated the British, where they had an incursion, and also the Spanish, and they established a free and independent republic in 1804. Of course, it's the second independent republic in the hemisphere. But I, I only just make a little tweak with the official CARICOM statement in relation to democracy, because I think that the, the, the good thing which cometh out of this is the teaching moment which is required for us to understand about Haiti, to learn about Haiti, it's a, for us to be a teaching moment about Haiti, about Africa, and about El Salvador, because those are the three references made, reportedly made by President Trump, about Haiti, Africa, and El Salvador being S dot 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 whole, H-O-L-E, countries. Now, you cannot understand the extent of underdevelopment in these countries without understanding that Europe and the United States of America underdeveloped these countries. You know, Walter Rodney wrote a book in 1972. Walter Rodney being a Caribbean intellectual and revolutionary out of Guyana, called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And then, of course, from the beginning of the 20th century, certainly the late 19th century. The United States of America joined Europe in the underdevelopment of Africa and the Caribbean. And that in the case of Latin America, the American, the Europeans were there and the Americans went a little earlier there since they were in the hemisphere in the early part of the 19th century. And you would remember the Monroe Doctrine of the 1820s. Monroe, from President Monroe in the United States, that you shouldn't have any European power come and interfere over here in our backyard, that we will control things. Now, 
It's a teaching moment. I made reference to two books already. C.L.R. James, The Black Jacobins. I want the young people who are listening to me to get it and read it. You heard me just mentioned Dr. Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. I want you to go and read it. I want you to know more about Walter Rodney than you know about Walter Raleigh. A lot of people know about Walter Raleigh. I want you to know about Walter Rodney. You know, when you're ready it too, you can go on Amazon and you'd read this. The Case for Reparatory Justice. Four essays by somebody called Ralph Gonzales. It's available on Amazon. And you'd read on the special situation for reparations for Haiti. You know, to understand what happened in Haiti. Haiti wasn't being recognized as a government. And the United States of America saw Haiti, a black nation on its doorstep, as a standing organizational center, an example for black people in the United States. And early o'clock, they were interested in controlling things in Haiti, in their interests. And of course, in 1825, when the French, that's 22 years after the death of Toussaint Louverture, who led the, 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 the the revolution and then, uh, against the French and established the, the, the state, the Haitian state, to his death, 22 years. France said, okay, we would establish back diplomatic relations with you. But France demanded reparations. They say, you have to pay us for the lands which our plantation people own. And you have to pay us for our property, namely the slaves. In other words, the slaves had to pay the French for freeing themselves. And from 1825, they borrowed the money through French banks. France organized it. And for years, into the 20th century, the debt which they had to pay, the French banks, was the highest item of expenditure on their budget. And then the Americans said, okay, we would lend you some money to pay, pay it off. And it wasn't until 1947 that they finished paying off the debt. From 1825, I want you to listen to me. I want you to read about it too. I want you to go on Amazon and get this book also and read about it. So when these things happen, denouncing the President of the United States is the easiest thing to do. It's the right thing to do, but it's the easiest thing to do. In any case, he's more than likely not going to pay any of us in the Caribbean any attention. Because perhaps if he thinks that Africa and Haiti are S dot 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 holes, he might think that all of us in the Caribbean 
are in occupation of such holes? I don't know. But the point is this, we can do something about educating ourselves and using that knowledge to steal ourselves against this kind of an ignorance and to put us in a position to uplift ourselves and carry us on a different path out of underdevelopment to development. Remember I tell you that Europe and America underdeveloped these places? And I'm taking my thesis from how Europe underdeveloped Africa. You know, it's, it's, it's there. If you want to read where I discuss that, among other things, there's also another one you find on Amazon, you know, called Our Caribbean Civilization and Its Political Prospects by also a person named Ralph Gonzalez. Go whilst I'm Prime Minister, I have to write. Not only, we not only have to build airports and deal with poverty, I also have to write so that the young people and those who are interested otherwise in reading would address these matters. We have to make the criticism of what he said. But that's the easy part. The part is for us to use it as a teaching moment. You listen to Fox and you listen to CNN, you listen to everybody. They have their own set of internal controversies and that's fine. I'm not getting involved with them. We. When people call us S dot 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 whole. Or to make it more explicit to those who are listening, S dot dot T whole. is to arm ourselves with knowledge, to study, and to use that knowledge to lift ourselves. That was Prime Minister, the Honorable Dr. Ralph Gonzalves, speaking at a press conference held yesterday, January 15th. We'll bring you more coverage from the Prime Minister's press conference in a subsequent program. We'll be back in a moment with part two of our interview with Minister of National Mobilization, the Honorable Frederick Stevenson. And later, we'll bring you highlights of the Ministry of Education's annual Thanksgiving church service. Stay with us. Real men protect children, not harm them. Under the Convention of the Rights of a Child, a child is anyone under the age of 18 and it's sexual abuse if you ask to see or touch their private parts, touch them inappropriately, show them or force them to touch your private parts, have sex with them, show them pornographic material or deliberately let them hear or see the act of sex. Real men don't abuse children and they don't encourage others to do it either. Be a real man. For more information, please contact these agencies. This message brought to you by UNICEF and this station. Welcome back. You're viewing the presentation from the API. Minister of National Mobilization, Social Development, Family, Gender Affairs, Persons with Disabilities and Youth, the Honorable Frederick Stevenson continues the conversation on the performance of his ministry during 2017. We now present to you part two of our interview with Minister Stevenson, where he highlights programs in Gender and Family Affairs divisions of his ministry. If we, if we look now at the Gender Affairs Division, um, 
there's several programs under the, under the um, Gender Affairs Division. The, we started with the, the Gender Affairs Division pursued activities that promoted the achievement of women to commemorate International Women's Day. And we had a, a conference and a match in Kingston as well as awarding women in different professions for their years of service to national development. Victim support programs were conducted in communities where domestic violence reports are highest nationally and additional support groups were formed. Um, we, we have done significant work in terms of um, advancing the, 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 the cause of um, and, and initiating programs to end gender-based violence. And what we've had um, throughout last year, we have had a lot of persons who came to the ministry from different areas. Um, we had graduation ceremonies in Calico. We had graduation ceremonies in Greggs. We had a graduation ceremony in, I think, Georgetown and other communities for victims male and females who came forward to be a part of the program and we did they were trained in 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 different um areas they were trained in leadership they were trained in cake decoration and icing they were trained in in juice making um, um bartending activities and and so on and one of the positive achievements out of this victim support program is that we have Mama's Kitchen in Greg's. The ladies who were part of that victim support formed themselves and were registered as a cooperative. Wow. And they, they do the, the cake baking, they do a lot of other stuff, pastry making and, and so on. And they, they sell so that group of person. I think um, 21 of them, they, they have their meetings on Tuesdays at the, the Greg's Primary School. And um, that is one of the success stories out of the Gender Affairs Division under the Victim Support Program um, in terms of ending gender-based violence. And I know that was a big issue in 2017. Yes. This, yes. this issue of domestic violence. So it's good that um, something positive came out of exactly that. Exactly so. Because the act was passed in 2015. It was proclaimed in 2016. And uh, we had a lot of discussion on it because of um, some, some issues and, and some rather terrifying crimes that, that came in 2017. But the, we've, the ministry, we would have started the whole discussion, national discourse on domestic violence when we, when we started to, to, to put together the act, the bill, so that we went around. We had national discussions throughout the length and breadth of St. Vincent and the Grenadines on, on the bill. Um, what, we, what we're doing now more um, in, in this year's program we're going to take the, the causes more into communities and get more persons involved. We want everybody on board, not, um, not only the, the persons who are victims of domestic violence, but everybody, because everybody ought to know. Because today it could be you, tomorrow it could be me. You, we never know. So we want to educate every, everybody. And you also want to reach the perpetrators. And we want to reach the perpetrators as well. And then, also under the Gender Affairs Division, we have the Teen Mothers Program. Um, you know, we, we have quite a number of young girls who, who get pregnant. And um, before 2001, they, they, they had to leave school. But we, we advanced the development of this program so that they, the young girls can, can go back to school. Let me just give you a breakdown of um, some of, of it. There are 68 participants um, on the teen program. 38 of them were newly enrolled in 2017. In the period 2013 to 2015, there were 63 participants. 
and uh, several of them were enrolled for the CSEC examination and the following results realized. In 2013, of the 22 students who wrote the CSEC, they got subjects, three subjects, and, and uh, got their certificates. In 2014, there were 25, and the average of four subjects they, they, they got for their, their CSEC. 2015, there were 16, and the average subject areas, subjects they, they got, um, five subjects, most of them got, got five subjects and more. On the social protection, the, the fifth um, area, um, this is program which is implemented by the Family Affairs Division has undergone some major restructuring since 2015 through the specialization of services. The division now comprises a public assistance unit and also one for vulnerable persons, such as the aged, disabled, and chronically ill persons. I'd give you just some statistics. For the period January to August 2016, the public assistance program was able to provide support for 3,500 households. That is about 9,000 individuals from 9,000 individuals. The total investment of the, that program for that period was $11 million. Um, in 2017, the program reached a total of 5,611 households, or uh, 8,300 individuals. We also have the uniform distribution process, which we engage the schools and communities through the, the, the division, as well as to the public assistance board members, because the schools would submit names to the to the ministry, the public assistance board members, there are 15 of them, 15 constituencies, they, they in, the, in the villages and so on, they would know somebody who is a child who is needy, parent who is indigent, who is poor, and they, they would also submit those names and um, they, they'd um, receive. We so had. But a, before you move on, how, how is one placed on public assistance? Persons are placed on public assistance from different forms. The, the law provides for the public assistance board members to complete a form. And uh, those forms would go into the, when they have their meetings and approved by the public assistance board. Because there's a board, there's a chairman, there's a board. So they, they go through the forms. If somebody is, is sick, um, somebody's indigent, somebody's poor, you have a vulnerable person, you have somebody who's, who's a dis who has a disability, and, and so on. So we, they, they complete the forms. If the person is sick, they, they, a, a medical certificate is, is also attached to the form along with the person's birth certificates and identification card and, and so. <laughs> and the board approves if the person is over 65 years, um, they, they get a public assistance of 250. If they below that, they get 225. I've heard it alleged, I'm sure you probably have heard it before, that there are some strong, healthy people on public assistance. Well, <laughs> How could that happen if it's so at all? No, no. I, you hear people, you would hear people <laughs> remark all these things. It is because most of the times persons see on a public assistance day when they, when we're paying public assistance they see young and the healthy persons going to collect money but they're not going to collect money for themselves <laughs> they're going to collect money for, for an elderly person mm -hmm. and uh, what used to happen before before i became the minister with responsibility for for the public assistance program you used to have persons, one person, well I wouldn't say before my, t yeah, before my time and, and a little into my time, you used to have persons who would collect 25 cards to go to collect public assistance for 25 the, the persons. The ID cards the for the uh -huh. cards because they had to sign. And that person would collect 
say 10, 15 dollars from every one of those 25 persons. It, it became even stronger when we increased the public assistance um, from 175 to 200 dollars. That um, persons would, would they, 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 they took the they took the twenty five dollars from every person, so the, the person would st the, el the old person would still get one seventy five, and the person who went to collect the, the public assistance for them twenty five dollars. So it's a business. They, they, they made they, it they into a business. A business. <laughs> and, and what we did, we, we made it myself and the permanent secretary. We we, um, we said that only two one person could only collect. Okay. So persons would see a young person that they standing up and, and so on and that is where the myths come from. In um in in South Windward, my constituency they and the public assistance officials, um, through the ministry they supply you with the the list of the persons who are on public assistance um every every quarter. So you could have a review and you can sit and talk with the public assistance board member and, and say, well, this child who is on public assistance for one reason or the other um, has gotten now to the age of 18 and not going to school. So you have to, we have to go through the list and look at it from time to time. Persons who have, who have passed on, died. The names, we had to remove those names from the list. So it, it's you always have an understanding of the list every three months, and all the the parliamentarians gets a copy of the list so that they can they can review. Also, we we'll continue to to work steadfastly to improve the the lives and the livelihoods of of every single Vincentian. In 2018, we have a we have a good staff. We've we had a new permanent secretary in. Um, Narissa Gittens on the retirement of the former P.S. Hull, and uh, we we continue to to work. Well, well um, from what you have told us so far, it seems that you've had a successful 2017. A lot of work. Yes. And um, I'm sure, as you mentioned, that most of the programs initiatives will roll over yes, into 2018. But um, is there anything in particular that your ministry is excited, looking forward to in this year? We're looking forward to moving into new spaces. <laughs> <laughs> um, the office that we presently occupy, the main office where my office is located, um, we are looking to, to re relocate from there. And I, I know that the the staff would be would be very happy to to move the what what exciting also would be that uh, in our new move all the divisions in the ministry would be located in one place that is that is the intention so the youth affairs department would move from from rose place and and be located centrally Family Affairs Division would, would be central. Cooperatives would be would be central. So everybody would be located in, in one space. So that you'd, you'd be able to have more interaction of, of staff instead of persons being separated here, there, and everywhere. And you, you, you know? And that is one of the things that um, the staff is looking forward to. Well, let me thank you very much for being on the program with us and we certainly wish you and your staff all the very best in this year. Thank you very much, Shannon, and, and I wish for, for my staff a good year and, and for the API staff a good year and we'll work closer together this year. Thank you. All God the best. best. Thank you. We'll be back in just a moment with our final segment. Stay with us. This is the presentation from the API. Children, don't be afraid to come to me. I am safe and friendly. School is my name. Education is a game. Come and have fun with me. Child friend.
friendly schools. An initiative of the Ministry of Education in collaboration with UNICEF. A production of the Ministry of Education's Media Unit. Welcome back. The Ministry of Education, Reconciliation and Information started the new year reflecting on the past and looking towards a brighter future. On January 11th, the ministry held its annual Thanksgiving church service at the New Testament Church of God, Wilson Hill. The API's Sharice John has the details in the following report. Reflect, rejoice, give thanks was the theme of the Ministry of Education's annual Thanksgiving church service held at the New Testament Church of God at Wilson Hill on Thursday, January 11, 2018. The annual event, which sees a number of ministry officials, educators, students, and well-wishers coming together to pay due homage to the worthy endeavor of educating our nation's youth, is also a platform for chatting the way forward for the education sector. The service included a number of performances by students, including one noteworthy rendition of Again I Say Rejoice by the C.W. Prescott School. The official welcoming remarks were offered by Parliamentary Secretary in the Ministry of Education, the Honorable Deborah Charles, who inspired the nation's educators to teach the children and not the subject. This morning, teachers, I just want to say to us, sometimes there may be students in our classes that may not look appealing or may have the worst attitude, but let us stick with them. Let us be dedicated to the task of teaching. Think about what the legacy you would leave after you would have left, after 30, 35, 40 years of teaching. What would the students say about you? What are they saying about me? I don't know. But think about what they would say about you. And students, this is not only for teachers, this is also for you that when you are given, you have been given much. This government has placed primary premium on you and you are to give it your best shot. Teachers will work hard with you and you are to accept the fact that they are working and therefore you give your best. The rest of us who are not particularly in the classrooms, it's also for us that we must be dedicated to the task we have to perform. This morning, I ask all of us to think of what this nation would be like if all of us as public servants, all of us as ministers, all of us as students and teachers, and teachers alike, give our best to the people whom we serve on a daily basis. As we go through this service, let's think about it, and God help us that we will continue to do our best daily. Thank you. Following an inspired praise and worship session by members of the teaching fraternity led by Janae Brown, a teacher at the St. Mary's Roman Catholic School, a very stirring sermon was delivered by Wendell Davis, past teacher and bishop of the New Testament Church of God, Diamonds Village. No doubt you have reason to celebrate your achievements and the many renowned faith that you have achieve. You have reason to reflect and to rejoice and to give thanks for all the many success because believe it or not, I am a believer and an embracer of what is commonly referred to as the education revolution. But my friends, I am sure that you are well aware that success has a cost. Development has a cost. 
Accordingly, we should always be mindful to do our due diligence and to do proper cost benefit analysis and make a determination for the results may just very well come at a cost that's to bring for us to be here. So I hope that my invitation is as a result of the opinion of some that I may just be able to challenge you to take a deeper look at your individual and collective selves and to take meaningful corrective actions when and where necessary. Yes, my friends, as I mentioned before, your achievement may warrant you to feel the urge to reflect, rejoice, and give thanks. But at closer examination, you might just find that we have given up too much for what we have gained. For it seems that we have given up morality. It seems that we have given up some Christian practices and belief. You see, yes, we have attained and yes, we have advanced in terms of our education and achievement and maybe otherwise. But I am deeply mindful of the fact that we seem to be going down a, a, a slippery slope in terms of our morals, in terms of our Christian virtue, in terms of the attitude and the, the, the way we talk of our children. Because we are we're at a stage where our children doesn't seem to understand what it means to trust God. I, I reflect on my day as a teacher. And in those days and prior to, when our schools were populated in terms of the teaching professor with male figures, and there was maybe sometimes an equal amount of male and female. So what the children lack at home in terms of parental guidance and in terms of the father figure, it was there present in the school. I am mindful today from what I've seen and what I've seen that there seem not to be a lot of males in our schools. So there seem not to be the father figure. Now the problem with this is that in a lot of our homes we know that fathers are missing. They're absent. Everybody good? Yes. In a lot of our homes, fathers are absent and missing. Yes, fathers are providing the, the, the material, the, the financial, uh, whatever is necessary. But when it comes to training and, and development and being there to ensure that proper discipline is instilled in our children, they are missing. And what you used to substitute for that in the past was the fact that there were male figures and sufficient male figures in our school. That is now absent. And so we are at a stage where our children have totally lost respect for every and anything. And I'm not saying what I say, but I'm saying easily. Because it's painful. When you pass the schools and, and understand what's happening, you have to ask yourself, who is to be blamed? Yeah, quiet silence is very good. Because you see, we have adopted, and I'm not knocking the educational system. Maybe, maybe that's why I, I, I deliberately, maybe encourage you to mention the fact that I used to be a teacher. And I, I enjoy what's happening, but we have adopted some ways that they are not for our good. Oh God, somebody talk to me now. Because if you would read from Proverbs itself, where Proverbs said you cannot afford to spare the rod, it's for the child. Because the wise man said that the rod doesn't kill anybody. But we know that there are mistreatments, and we know that there are abusers, and we know that there are all kinds of stuff. But I reflected a few days ago that I grew up in the harsh system of beating. I mean, I get plates where it's too school days. I get legs if my previous days were not clean. I get legs if I didn't have a bed from the waist. I get legs if I couldn't step. I get legs if I couldn't do homework. And I dare not go and tell the parent. And you cannot convince me today that I'm any worse off for that. In fact, if it wasn't for that, I would not have been here. 
While using various biblical references in support of his view, Bishop Davis expressed his desire to see the return of more traditional values to tackle the challenge of dealing with misbehavior in children. You see, the Bible said, and I speak to you now, the Bible said, uh, no trace in it, but the present time seems to be joyous. No, no correction, but the present time seems to be joyous. When I was in flock, I didn't enjoy it. When I was in flock, I didn't like it. I wanted to rebel, but I knew what happened life to me, and I'm glad. I'm glad that there was somebody who was willing to look up and show that they don't want straight. I'm saying to us this morning that our advancement will be greater. Our achievements will be more if we ensure that morality prevails in our schools. And when the home is lacking, like I mentioned about those uh, children in that village, that I'm going to call its name, that they don't go to church and they do not pray, that the school need to take all the responsibility. You see, because the reality of the matters, brothers and sisters, and those of you on the platform, the reality of the matter is without God in our lives, we're done. Without God leading the ship, the shipwreck, I am calling our children to back to a place where we are respect and, and morality and, and Christian virtue and, and an understanding and the ability to say I'm sorry and accept I'm sorry for what it means without becoming rebellious and without becoming revengeful. Our country is advancing on the one hand, but we are losing our young people. We are losing them to crime and to violence. We are losing them to excuse the word badmanism and the baddest man on the block and you can walk into the classroom and you can do as you like them and help us all because if the teacher dare correct you you will go and tell your parent and the parent might know somebody in front of and so we go and tell them and they'll get you out of the system children your future depends on your relationship with God. Amen. Teachers, I hope we get back if you're not there. Honorable Charles, if you're not there, get back to the place where the teaching profession is not just to make up with God, but you enter into the world of a love for children, a love for the society. The church service concluded with prayers of intercession offered on behalf of institutions, administration, and other stakeholders within the education sector. Oh God, if we start the win, Lord God, we are going to reap the whirlwind. So right now, in the name of Jesus, roll back the curtains of heaven and show us where you brought us from, oh God, and where we could have been this morning. And let your will be done, dear God. Father, I pray for instructors. Lord, I pray for our educators. I pray for our teachers, God. Lord, we were reminded this morning, God, that we must teach the children and not the subject. So help us, oh God, when we get before the children. Lord, that we will teach them and not the, the subject. Oh God, help us to love them as we are to love them. Lord God, move the distractions, dear God. And most of all, God, help us to work as unto you and not unto men. I pray in the name of Jesus, this year indeed would be a productive year. Oh God, administratively, that those who are sitting indeed on their lawyers will get their acts together. And oh God, they will work together. And so Lord God, we will have growth Thank you for what has happened before, but we will have even more. Oh God, it astronomically it will be, things will advance even more in our school system because as the Ministry of Education work, oh God, that we all the stakeholders indeed will work with them as a, to implement, oh God, the policies. 
Lord, we just want to thank you for what you're going to do, oh God. Even as, oh God, they are seeking to do what is right in the interest of our nation's youth. We are praying, oh God, that they, they will have the, they will have the, the gumption, whether it's a moral gumption, oh God, they will have the spiritual gumption to enact certain things, oh God, that need to be enacted. Help them, guide them, bless them, oh God. We are praying the favor of God, over oh God, of the Ministry of Education. Like Moses, he said, if you don't go, we will not go. Oh God, without you in the classroom, oh God, there is no success. So God, we thank you for your presence. We pray for the parents, oh God. You said that you will supply all our needs according to your riches in glory. So parents who don't have to give and to support their children, I pray that you will so provide and supply their needs today. You are our Jehovah Jireh, and we put our trust in you. Yes. We put our confidence in you. We pray that you will have preeminence, O oh God, yes. in every area. Have preeminence in the name of Jesus. And we declare success in this year in Jesus' wonderful name with thanksgiving. Amen. Reporting for the Agency for Public Information, I'm Sharice John. And that is how we end this evening's presentation from the Agency for Public Information. Thank you very much for viewing. I trust that you found it to be quite informative. We invite you to join us again on Thursday DV at 8 p.m. for our next presentation. Until then, I am Shana Daniel. Good night and God bless.